Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. The first portfolio is uh, COVID recovery and parliamentary business. I'd remind members that questions one and three are grouped together and I'll take any supplementaries on those questions after both have been answered. Uh, and as ever, if anybody wishes to ask a supplementary, I'd invite them to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is measuring progress on its COVID recovery strategy commitment to improve financial security for low-income households. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has identified a range of high-level indicators that will help to measure progress towards achieving individual outcomes in the COVID recovery strategy. The majority of our outcome indicators are drawn from population surveys or large administrative data sets, which report annually and which are more measurable than the outcomes themselves. We are working to identify additional intermediate indicators that report more frequently and can therefore identify and influence real-time trends in advance. Claire Baker. Okay, thank you. In October 21, uh, the COVID recovery strategy set out a number of actions to address financial security for low-income households in the following 12 to 18 months, including the second benefits take-up strategy. The annual report that was published in October showed take-up of the job start payment remains far too low at only 29%, with the rate attributed to low awareness of the benefit and a lack of clarity around eligibility. There are also concerns that those leaving school um, are unable to access this support. So can the Cabinet Secretary advise on action underway to ensure that young people on low incomes moving from a period of sustained unemployment or directly from school into work are getting the support they are entitled to? Cabinet Secretary. I, I accept the point that Claire Baker makes that one of the challenges is to ensure that people are fully utilising the benefits to which they are entitled at the moment in life to which they are uh, entitled to that benefit. So we take a number of steps and uh, my colleague, the Minister for Social Security, has set out some of this information to Parliament previously to raise awareness about individual benefits and to maximise take-up. That is our intention, that is our desire to ensure that is the case. So there will be awareness raising measures taken. Um, we will obviously look very carefully at the effectiveness of those um, uh, awareness raising measures. Um, the government's marketing strategies generally uh, result in good engagement and good participation, uh, but I will look specifically at the points that Claire Baker raises to identify if there are further actions that we need to take to raise awareness and to boost participation. Question three, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the new report by the Resolution Foundation stating that the average household will be £2,100 worse off by the end of the next financial year, how ministers across government are working to prioritise support to low income households is set out in its COVID recovery strategy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is prioritising funding to help household finances across Scotland. We are taking action to increase financial security for low income households. And the Emergency Budget Review confirmed a range of additional support in response to the cost crisis. These include increasing the Scottish Child Payment to £25 per week, doubling the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million, and providing local authorities with additional funding for discretionary housing payments. In total, the Scottish Government has allocated around £3 billion this financial year to contribute towards mitigating the increased cost, the increased cost crisis. Over £1 billion of this support is only available in Scotland, with the remainder being more generous than that provided elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Marie McNair. I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer and his long-standing recognition of the impact the pandemic has had on low-income households. The COVID recovery strategy rarely has a focus on groups more likely to experience low income. One such group is families with three or more children, and it's correctly acknowledged that our Scottish Child Payment will be assistance to these families. But does the Deputy First Minister also acknowledge that the UK Government's two-child policy with its abhorrent rape clause hinders our efforts and shows that increased powers and social security are necessary to maximise the support we give to these families? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, Marie McNair is absolutely correct that the two-child limit can have significant and negative effects on household income, which is why the Scottish Government has not adopted that approach in relation to the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, so the uh, families who have more than two children are able to access the Scottish Child Payment should they be eligible. 
Uh, we are obviously taking measures which try to challenge and tackle the effect of measures taken by the UK Government, which essentially make our challenge even greater as we work to reduce child poverty within Scotland. And, uh, our measures um, are having a beneficial effect on child poverty levels in Scotland, and we will continue that relentless focus to support families to boost their household income. And brief supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Following the Glasgow City Council decision last week on community grant funds, a number of organisations, including some of which provide mental health and access to food support, are facing funding cuts and even closure. So, given the bleak outlook for households, as highlighted for the member for Clyde Bank and Wilgai, will the government ensure that the organisations in Glasgow and elsewhere providing this lifeline support will not be forced to pull out of communities and even face closure when these communities are facing such vital hardship? Uh, obviously, there is a range of organisations who are providing valuable and vital support to individuals within our communities, and the Government wants to make sure that we maximise support to those organisations. I accept that there are, and I was very candid about this to Parliament in setting out the budget in December, there are very significant financial challenges that all public sector organisations face as they wrestle with the cost crisis. But I think if we all maintain a focus on supporting those in greatest need, we can do all that we can, or as much as we can, to try to address the financial hardship that individuals face. Question two, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Minister for Parliamentary Business plans to propose the scheduling of time to consider legislation to end sex buyers' legal impunity as part of the business for the current parliamentary year. Mr Georgia. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Mr Kidd for his question. Details of future legislation will be announced in the programme for government in the normal way. Our policy in relation to prostitution, which includes considerations around the purchase of sex, is currently being taken forward through a framework for Scotland, which will seek to challenge men's demands for prostitution and support those impacted. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister very much for that response. <clears throat> Yesterday, the cross-party group on human trafficking heard from Valiant Ritchie, the OSCE's special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings. In this, Mr Ritchie emphasised that full criminalisation of the purchase of sex is by far the most effective legislative <laughs> approach to tackling human trafficking for sexual exploitation. Given that this unrelenting sexual exploitation of women and children is ongoing and that we have power to effect real change here, does the Minister agree that this devolved matter should be treated with urgency in this parliamentary session and that space should be, hopefully be made for further parliamentary engagement? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I agree with Bill Kidd that this is an extremely important issue. And last December, uh, as part of the 16 days of activism to end violence against women and girls, the Parliament reaffirmed there is no place for sexual exploitation in Scotland. I am currently working with ministers to agree the upcoming legislative programme, and I can assure Mr Kidd that this Parliament will continue to be uh, kept informed by the lead minister as this work progresses. A brief supplementary, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following on from last night's human trafficking cross-party group, it was clear that countries that did not hold sex buyers accountable for their abuse were attractive destinations for traffickers. We also heard from Mr Ritchie about the clear targeting of Ukrainian refugees by traffickers and exploiters to the sex industry, making this, an, this issue even more urgent. Can I ask about the clear timescales as to when legislation to hold sex buyers to account will be brought forward? And in the meantime, what steps the Scottish Government are taking to protect Ukrainian refugees and other vulnerable groups? Minister. As I said to Mr Kidd uh, in my answer previously, I understand how important this is as an issue and uh, how we move forward with it is also extremely important. Uh, as I mentioned as well, as we are currently working towards Year 3's uh, legislative programme and uh, discussions will be ongoing with other ministers with regard to this. And I will uh, ensure that the, the questions that have been asked here today are brought up when I have my uh, bilateral meeting with that portfolio. Question number four, Natalie Don, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact that rising inflation could have on its ability to deliver on the priority outcomes set out in the COVID recovery strategy. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the financial situation, including high levels of inflation, is particularly challenging given the absence of financial powers to compensate for these factors. The Scottish Government has prioritised spending, which supports those who need it most, 
guided in part by the principles of the COVID recovery strategy. Last year's emergency budget review and the 2023-24 budget provide funding which helps families, backs business and protects the delivery of public services. The Scottish Government is committed to making progress towards the shared COVID recovery strategy outcomes in partnership with local government and other partners and will continue to prioritise spending which is targeted to support those in most need. Natalie Doan. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. One of the key priorities within the recovery strategy is financial security for low-income households, and it's been announced this morning that inflation is still at an eye-watering 10.5%, five times higher than the Chancellor's target, with basic food items such as milk and cheese increasing by up to 46%. So would the Minister agree that, sorry, the Deputy First Minister agree that our ability to deliver on the COVID recovery outcomes is being made much more difficult by the Tories' economic Economic incompetence. Cabinet Secretary. I was explicit with Parliament in the budget statement in December just the scale of the challenge that is posed by the uh, economic turbulence that has uh, been experienced since the uh, start of the war in Ukraine, but exacerbated by the twin effects of Brexit and the uh, aftermath of the ludicrous uh, mini budget in early September. So the presence of inflation in our economy at the very high levels that is, uh, is currently faced, with an even more acute pressure on low-income households because many of the foodstuffs upon which low-income low households depend have increased disproportionately and higher than the headline rate of inflation, uh, those uh, issues are of significant challenge. That is why the Government has prioritised the increase in the Scottish Child Payment to the extent that we have. It is why I also announced an uprating of benefits under our control by 10.1 per cent to do all that we can to try to address the difficult circumstances that low-income households face. Question number five was not lodged, so question number six, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will review its COVID recovery strategy in light of rising COVID-19 infection rates. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the COVID recovery strategy focuses on reducing systemic inequalities and reforming public services. The Scottish Government remains committed to this work and there are therefore no plans to review the strategy. The Scottish Government remains alert to the ongoing threat posed by COVID-19. Public Health Scotland have worked in collaboration with the Scottish Government, local government and other partners to meet the commitments in the COVID-19 strategic framework update to develop and publish an outbreak management plan. We continue to utilise this, apply careful judgment and take all relevant factors into account to ensure that responses are appropriately targeted and the necessary resources prioritised to deal with the effects of rising COVID-19 infection rates. Katie Clark. The Scottish Government ended free testing last April, which has led to some of the poorest in society being priced out of accessing lateral flow tests, which now cost an average of £9 for a pack of five. This decision is at odds with the aims of the COVID-19 recovery strategy to support low-income households. With current high COVID rates, will the Scottish Government review its strategy and explore the feasibility of reintroducing free tests? Tests. Cabinet Secretary. The, the Government obviously has taken a range of measures to ensure that we have the available intelligence to support us in the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and obviously with the current rates uh, estimated to be at approximately 1 in 25, we, we are facing um, a significant challenge. And these issues are regularly reviewed by the Cabinet and also the Ministerial Group on Health Issues that is chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and also by the resilience discussions that are chaired by the First Minister, which are taking place on a weekly basis. I understand exactly the point that Katie Clark puts to me and, uh, and understand and accept its significance. But I do have to say that in the absence of consequential funding to provide for this from the United Kingdom Government, we would have to consider uh, funding of such approaches from the existing resources available to the National Health Service in Scotland. And as Katie Clark will know, we have um, we've, we've taken some sig very significant decisions to boost the funding available to the Health Service by increasing tax for higher earners in the next financial year. Um, but we would have to wrestle with that question as part of the, um, the overall uh, financing of our public services. So I, I will 
consider further the issue that Katie Clark puts to me because it is a serious issue and I assure her that these questions will be regularly considered as part of the, the management groups that I talked about who are looking at the effect of the pandemic on our public services. A brief supplementary, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, an important tool in tackling rising uh, COVID infection rates is the uh, booster vaccination programme, which is currently being rolled out. Uh, I know of several constituents who have contacted me who are in the over 50s age group who have not received appointment letters for a booster vaccination. And although they are able to access drop in vaccination centres, which are a very welcome resource, often having the uh, prompt and reminder from a, a, a uh, appointment letter is what encourages people to attend. Does the Deputy First Minister know how widespread this issue is and what more might be done to make sure that over 50s and those in other vulnerable groups are reminded of the need to get a booster? Cabinet Secretary. I, I would reassure Mr Fraser that the uptake rates are, uh, are, are really quite high. They're in excess of 70 per cent for the eligible population. I have in my mind 77 per cent, but I don't have that number in front of me, but I will tomorrow morning when I'm at the COVID-19 Recovery Committee, so mm -hmm. I shall perhaps be able to give them a more definitive answer by that time. But th these are really quite high levels of, of, uh, of vaccination uptake. Obviously, we, we've taken an approach to awareness raising, which is designed to maximise the participation in these programmes. And obviously, the, the, you know, as I say, there are very high levels of uptake and we should continue to do that. I think the drop-in facilities that are available are, um, uh, are, 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 are handy and convenient for people. Uh, but I will consider further the point that he puts to me about um, some written communication, uh, because obviously it's in all of our interests if we have a highly vaccinated population. Question number seven, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its longer term cross government plan for COVID 19 recovery. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the COVID recovery strategy contains over 70 actions that will support people across Scotland and particularly those most affected during the pandemic. It focuses on increasing financial security for low income households, enhancing the well being of children and young people, and creating good green jobs and fair work. I co-chair the COVID Recovery Strategy Programme Board alongside the COSLA President. Together with our partners, we oversee recovery activity and at our meeting in September, attendees noted the expectations of the COVID Recovery Programme were being delivered. The Board is meeting again next week and minutes are published on the Scottish Government website. Annabel Ewing. I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer and note indeed the, the 70 actions in the recovery plan. But on the important issue of COVID booster vaccinations, can the Deputy First Minister advise what the current thinking is as regards a further programme of such booster vaccinations later this year and indeed in the years to come? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Annabel Ewing raises an important issue, and as I've just uh, rehearsed in my answer to Margaret Fraser, it is important to encourage uptake of the vaccination programme and we are encouraged by the levels of uptake that are taking place, but I would encourage anybody who still is in the eligible population groups and has not been vaccinated to take up the opportunity of that vaccination. Um, our approach on vaccination is based on the clinical advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, and I would expect the GCVI to consider the question that Annabel Ewing puts to me to, uh, uh, about the provision of further booster vaccinations in 2023 or in uh, later years uh, and to provide advice to the government. And obviously, we stand ready to implement that advice. Um, uh, in the interim, I would simply reiterate that the Winter 22 booster programme uh, campaign remains open until the end of March and appointments are still available. And I would encourage anyone eligible who is yet to be vaccinated to come forward. Question number eight, Donald Cameron. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what government business it plans to bring forward for the current parliamentary year. Minister Jordan. Jordan. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Mr Cameron for his question. Proposals for government business in Parliament are agreed by the Scottish Cabinet, subject to consideration by the Parliamentary Bureau and in turn approval by the Parliament. So as the year progresses and things move on, this will be the process. Donald Cameron. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his response? There are increasing concerns that the Scottish Parliament's processes are inadequate when it comes to legislative scrutiny of the executive. And for that reason, I intend to bring forward a Members' Bill on parliamentary reform. Can I take this opportunity to invite 
the Scottish Government to work constructively with me on this project? And in the first instance, will the Minister meet with me so that we can discuss these issues together? Minister. Uh, although I do not agree with some of the uh, points that the member made, I'm quite happy to meet with them and discuss things as we move forward. But can I just give some examples of some of the times where you know, there seems to be an idea that legislation does, we don't get time to scrutinise uh, legislation in here. When we had the recent gender recognition reform bill, the government listened to concerns of the committee and agreed to propose a deadline on the understanding that additional time would be agreed if a larger number of amendments came in than expected. And then National Care Service, the Bureau agreed a longer stage one deadline following feedback from the committees. And with Hunting with Dogs Bill, the RAIN Committee recently requested the stage two of Hunting with Dogs was extended by one week, effectively creating a stage 2.5, in other words, presiding officer, and revised the deadline in order to do this. So, on the whole, I believe we do uh, work with those in opposition and other parties and with the committee system to ensure that scrutiny is there for the Scottish Government. Brief supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thanks, Presiding Officer. On the subject of fixed links, during the 2021 Scottish Parliament campaign, the First Minister told local media in Shetland that she was, and I quote, not just open to it, but actually quite enthusiastic about seeing if we can make the case. But the Scottish Government hasn't scheduled a debate on the matter yet, so would the Minister contemplate a debate about fixed links and tunnels so that the case can be made and help reverse depopulation and save costs in the long term for internal ferry replacement. Minister. Uh, I take on board what Ms Wishart said and seeing as normally my answer would be speak to your business manager but in your case Ms Wishart I'll make a special allowance and uh, I'll bring it up uh, with the, to the Bureau and the PO myself at Bureau. Thank you very much uh, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on COVID recovery and parliamentary business. It's time to move to the next portfolio which is finance and economy. Again I would encourage members wishing to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. Uh, there is an awful lot of interest uh, in this series of questions so I would make a, a plea for brevity in questions and indeed in responses. And I call first question number one, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide all hospitality businesses with 75% business rates relief in 2023-24. Minister Tom Arthur. Having set out a strong, strong non-domestic rates package in the draft budget, the Scottish Government have no current plans to introduce any further reliefs. As a result of that package, around half of properties in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors in Scotland will already pay no rates in 2023-24 due to the most generous small business relief package in the UK. The budget statement also delivered the number one ask of the business community by freezing the poundage, delivering the lowest poundage in the UK for the fifth year in a row. Annie Wells. Next year, hospitality businesses in Wales and to the south will receive 75% business rates relief. But Scottish hospitality businesses are getting no extra relief from the SNP. 100,000 Scottish businesses are being shortchanged. They are missing out on more than £200 million of support. How will our economy recover when Scottish businesses are worse off than companies across the rest of the UK? Minister. As I outlined in my original answer to Ms Wells, we already provide the most generous package of rates relief for uh, businesses anywhere within the UK, including freezing the poundage, again making it uh, the lowest rate for the fifth year in a row. Uh, the reality is that we have to take decisions in the round um, when setting our budget, and any additional revenue to be supplied for rates relief would have to come from a corresponding De decrease in another area of government. So if there is a particular area of funding that Ms Wells wishes to see reduced to support non-domestic rates relief, then I am happy to have that discussion. There are a number of supplementaries. I want to get them all in, but they will have to be brief, as will the responses. First, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the decision to freeze the rates poundage, foregoing £308 million of income while ensuring 100,000 businesses pay no rates at all. Can the Minister say how much it would cost to provide 75 per cent rates relief on all for all hospitality businesses? And has Mrs Wells or any other Tory MSP suggested from where in the Scottish budget these resources should be found or if taxes should be increased to pay for it? Minister. 
It would cost an estimated £85 million pounds to provide hospitality properties to 75 per cent non-domestic rates, relief capped at 110,000 per business in 2023-24. As I already mentioned in my answer to Annie Wells, our package of reliefs, which is worth an estimated £744 million, pounds, will see around half of the properties in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors benefit from 100 per cent small business bonus scheme relief alone in 2023-24. And as I said, if any party wants to enhance the relief package and offer in the budget, then I would welcome hearing their alternative fully funded proposals. Daniel Johnson. Uh, short of uh, a discount, we know that retail businesses pay a fifth of non-domestic rates when they only account for 10 per cent of the economy. So short of that discount, surely there is a case to rebalance and recalibrate between sectors based on their economic contribution. Minister. Well, as, as the members are aware, the process of setting the uh, rateable value is one carried out independently by the Scottish assessors. The point he touches on, though, is a broader concern that I appreciate um, members will have with the way in which non-domestic rates operate, namely the lack of a correlation often between rateable value and the economic performance of a business. This is a matter that prompts you know, requests for fundamental forms for business um, or for, for non-domestic rates relief reform or non-domestic rates reform more generally. These are discussions I'm happy to have, but this is a complex area, and as I say, my door is always open to any member who wishes to discuss this in more detail. Beatrice Wisher. Hospitality businesses in Shetland were grateful for the support given to them during the COVID pandemic, but many are now feeling left behind. So what more can the Minister do to help island businesses through this difficult winter? Minister. Well, as I would say, we provide a, a range of support through uh, the release packages that we have uh, provided through the non-domestic rate system, including rural rates relief as well. Um, as I say, we have to take decisions in the round. The package of support we are providing on non-domestic rates, which applies Scotland-wide, is one which is the most generous in the UK. And as I said previously, uh, in response to other members' questions, if there are specific proposals that members have for reform of non-domestic rates, I'm happy to discuss that. If there are specific relief they would like to see, then I would welcome conversation, but it has to be with fully funded, costed proposals. And very briefly, Katie Clark. Unite the Union's Get Me Home Safely campaign calls on councils to make free, safe transport home for late night workers a requirement for new and extended alcohol licences. And some councils like North Ayrshire and Eastern Bartonshire have backed the campaign. Will the Scottish Government explore making the provision of safe transport home for late night workers a condition of future? Future support for hospitality businesses. Briefly as possible, Minister. Uh, the, the issue of conditionality around rates relief has been raised in a number of different contexts. Uh, there are complexities to that, but it's something I'd be happy to discuss with the member in more detail if they would like. Okay, question number two, Sandra Schoolhani. Apologies for arriving during the session. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it has fully considered the economic consequences of its presumption against new oil and gas exploration both to workers within the industry and to the wider economy as a whole. Minister Richard Lockett. The oil and gas sector and the highly skilled workforce have long been at the forefront of energy innovation and have an important role to play in our energy transition. However, as we all know, the North Sea Basin is mature and production will inevitably decline. The draft energy strategy and just transition plan draws on established industry data as well as independent work commissioned from consultants that analyses the energy and economic contributions of the North Sea and wider oil and gas sector in Scotland. This includes production forecasts and the expected growth of Scotland's low carbon energy sectors and impact of the energy transition on employment and the wider economy. As a responsible government, we have set out a pathway to ensure a fair and just transition. Any other approach would only serve to put jobs and our economy at risk. Sandy Schoolhani. The oil and gas communities of the northeast of Scotland will be devastated at the disregard shown to them by this SNP government. The sector is highly important to our economy and even in our just transition away from fossil fuels, which is estimated to take 25 years or more, it will be a necessary component of our ongoing energy infrastructure. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that halting oil and gas production would simply increase our reliance on foreign imports of oil and gas, propping up questionable regimes, which will only amplify and relocate the greenhouse emissions we seek to reduce, as well as damaging domestic job creation in Scotland? Minister. Uh, firstly, this is a question about future exploration, not existing oil and gas production, as the member seems to suggest. 
It is the case that around a third of 1999 levels will be produced in the North Sea by 2035, and less than 3 per cent – I will repeat that – less than 3 per cent of the 1990 peak by 2050. Therefore, we have a responsibility, as the energy strategy fulfils, by looking to the 2030s and the 2040s and future generations and their energy needs and the need for jobs, to look at what we can do to make sure that we meet our responsibilities as a country and not just focus on today's headlines. And in terms of jobs, the research from RGU and other institutions, but particularly RGU in this case, have said that it's estimated the number of jobs will rise from 19,000 in terms of low carbon jobs in 2019 to 77,000 jobs by 2050, an actual increase in energy jobs in North East Scotland and elsewhere. And I have to say to the member, as someone who represents a constituency with many oil and gas jobs, and indeed spends a lot of time through my ministerial responsibilities in North East Scotland, I'm very familiar with the views of the oil and gas sector and the fact that the oil and gas majors are investing heavily in and are very committed to the energy transition. And I think the Scottish Tory party has to make up its mind. If it wants a transi transition, what does it want to transition to? Because we want to transition to clean energy for Scotland and tackling climate change. We do need, I think, slightly briefer uh, responses, but a supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Prime Minister's questions last week, Rishi Sunak committed to supporting the North East energy sector. Does the Minister agree with me that the Prime Minister should put his money where his, where his mouth is, match the Scottish Government's £500 million Just Transition Fund and stop delaying investment into the ACORN CCS project, which to date has been left completely in the lurch? Briefly as possible, Richard Lopez. It's very good points, and of course the UK government has extracted over £300 billion in the North Sea should match the Scottish government's £500 million for North East Scotland and Murray's Just Transition Fund. And likewise, in terms of the previous question about the economic assessment of our energy plans, what has the UK government's economic assessment been of refusing to take forward the ACON project that would create up to 20,000 new jobs in Scotland, many of which would be in North East Scotland? Question number three, Fiona Hislop to ask the Scottish Government what the continuing impact of Brexit is on Scotland's key economic sectors. Minister Ivan McKee. It is clear now that uh, Brexit, 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 Brexit is holding back our public services and scaring our economy. Leaving the EU has made it harder, for example, to recruit doctors and nurses for our NHS. And the latest research by Nuffield Trust shows that without Brexit, the UK would have had over 4,000 more specialist doctors from the EU. Meanwhile, exports of some Scottish industries have plummeted due to Brexit trade barriers. Just look at fruit and vegetables, where EU exports have been slashed by half since 2019. That said, the Scottish Government will continue to support our businesses through our export growth plan, supporting Scotland's export performance and enabling it to outpace the UK's our international goods exports, for example, were up 16.7% in 2022 compared to the first nine months of 2019, when UK figures were only up 2.4%. Does the Minister agree that Brexit was never a one-off event or vote, but is having a continuous negative effect on our economy with no apparent positives. We also know that businesses that export are more likely to pursue innovations. So with Scottish exporters continuing to face growing challenges trading with countries in the EU, this continuing Brexit effect will also impact on innovations in our economy for the future. And does he agree that the longer Scottish businesses remain out of the EU, the more damage Brexit will bring to Scotland's economy and that the only political route to full benefits of trading in the single market with the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats now both embracing Brexit is for Scotland to become an independent state and join the European Union. Minister. As the member correctly identifies, Scotland's economy will continue to suffer while we remain outside of the European single market because of a hard Brexit we did not vote for. And only through the full powers of independence will Scotland replicate the success of comparable countries which are more prosperous, more productive and fairer than the UK. Question number four, Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any investment arising from the Taste Cities deal. Cabinet Secretary. President, officer, the Taste Cities region's deal uh, has had a successful first two years since it was signed in December 2020 with over £70 million of government funding already received by regional partners. The partnership is currently preparing their latest annual report, which will outline the achievements to the end of September last year, 
which we anticipate including securing over £120 million of investment into the region. Joe Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Tay Cities deal is delivering vital support to the region's economy in these challenging times, supporting skills development, providing training and job opportunities and driving addi additional investment into the area. Can the Cabinet Secretary say more about investments in Dundee specifically and how this is helping to support local employment and drive innovation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the, uh, the Dundee and Mr Fitzpatrick's constituency has benefited significantly from the Tay Cities deal. Um, the city's universities are benefiting with £25 million from the Scottish Government towards enhanced infrastructure for life sciences, innovation at the University of Dundee and support for the refurbishment that led to the cyber quarter development at Abertay University. Uh, that opened in June and aims to support 150 businesses in the cyber security sector, which is absolutely vital in the developments in uh, the global economy. Um, uh, not quite in Mr Fitzpatrick's constituency, but the other end of the city, the investment from the Scottish Government um, around the Michelin Scotland Investment Park um, is significant in supporting the development of new opportunities. And if Mr Fitzpatrick will forgive me, the developments at the James Hutton Institute in my own constituency, which is very close to the boundary of the city of Dundee, is welcome into the bargain. And brief supplementaries, firstly from Murdoch Fraser. Th thank you, Presiding Officer. I would agree with Mr Fitzpatrick uh, about the value of the Taste Cities deal. In line with the rest of the developed world, we have seen substantial construction price inflation over the last two years since the uh, Taste Cities deal was signed. Uh, when I visited the James Hutton Institute in December, they did raise this issue with me as to whether the funds that had been allocated in the deal would now cover the construction costs of the very welcome major uh, infrastructure build they now have to commit to. Has the Scottish Government done any work looking at whether the, the funds allocated in 2020 will now be sufficient to meet these increased costs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, th this, this is an issue which I raised in my budget statement uh, to Parliament in uh, December because the issues that Mr Fraser uh, correctly highlights will undoubtedly put pressure on these long-term projects. So projects that, for example, were, had an estimated cost in the benign climate of 2020 are now in a very significantly different position with the effect of hyperinflation. Uh, obviously, the, the, we, we hope that there will be reductions in inflation, but I, I have to say quite openly to Parliament there will be uh, challenges about uh, uprating projects that have been affected by inflationary costs because it's a problem that we're wrestling with right across government and we will do our level best in the capital programme to address that to ensure that projects are able to, uh, to be taken forward. But there will be strains in city deals which are long-term growth deals because of the effect of inflation. And briefly, Willie Rennie. Uh, St Andrews University has delivered their part of the Tay Cities deal at the new Eden campus in Garbridge. But they're bursting with ideas about what to do next. They want to crack on with the next phase of the Tay Cities deal. Has the Minister had discussions with the UK Government about that next phase? And if not, will he start them? Cabinet Secretary. We're certainly open to, uh, to further discussions on these questions. I compliment St Andrews University on the development at Garbridge. I drove past it the other week there on my way to St Andrews. So it's, uh, it's looking very good and it's a, a very significant uh, enhancement of the, uh, of the area and also a, a very sustainable proposition that has been developed. So we will, we, we've not had further discussions with the UK Government about um, a further round of city deals. I, uh, Mr McKee will be in uh, the presiding officer's constituency uh, on Friday for the signing of the Islands deal, which is the latest of the deals involving the island communities. Um, uh, but we are, are very happy to have further discussions with the UK Government on these questions. Uh, he'll be afforded a very warm welcome. Question number five, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government how it takes the complexity of human behaviour into account during financial policy decision making. Mr. Tomar. The Scottish Government is aware of the risks and benefits arising from behavioural responses to policy proposals and actively works with stakeholders such as HMRC to monitor and continually improve the evidence base to help inform policy development. The Scottish Fiscal Commission are responsible for producing independent forecasts of devolved tax and social security spending for the Scottish Budget and for making judgments about the scale of any behavioural responses and their fiscal implications in those forecasts. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Minister for that response. He'll be aware 
chair of the Finance and Public Administration Committee, has launched an inquiry into approaches to decision-making in government. One key aspect is to fully understand how to assess risk. Does the Scottish Government have an established approach to the disaggregation of risk, and if so, can they outline their principles? Minister. Well, can I say I very much uh, welcome and recognise the committee's work in this particular area and indeed its continuing interest in, in this area when I have been before the committee. And I'm sure this will make a valuable contribution to the subject, including the area of risk management. The Scottish Government has a robust risk management framework to support the identification, assessment, management and reporting of risks during the development and delivery of policy within each portfolio and across government. This helps promote best practice for the identification and assessment of risk in the development and delivery of policy. This framework aligns to the principles of risk management outlined in the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which is publicly available. And we supplement to Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. At the same committee, the Minister said in answer to a question to John Mason that he understands the importance of the private rented sector when it comes to the mobility of the working population. So can I ask again what the Scottish Government is going to do to address the concerns of landlord associations and some local authorities that the proposed increase in the tax on the additional dwelling supplement, which of course comes at the same time as the rent freeze, will cause some landlords to exit the market, thereby threatening the supply of private rented accommodation, which is so crucial to the economy, especially in the rural areas. Briefly as possible, Minister. Well, as I, I, set out in some uh, length uh, committee um, yesterday. We take decisions on fiscal policy in the round. Yes, the policy intention behind the additional dwelling supplement is clear. It is to provide support for first-time buyers, but it also has a clear objective on raising revenue. With regards to the specific uh, point made with regards to local government, as I said, the, the issues there and the current lack of parity with RSLs is something that has been considered through the ADS review, and I will be in a position to update Parliament on the outcome of that review soon. Question number six, Neil Bibby. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to an announcement from Amazon that it is to close its Gurukh site. Mr Ivan McKee. Uh, I spoke with Amazon last week, but I uh, was very disappointed there was no clarity on the rationale for the potential closure in Guruk. I've since written to uh, their US headquarters to uh, seek further clarification on those points and to seek a conversation with those behind the company's operational decision. I've had a response back from Amazon in the UK. I'm about to reply back to that because, to my mind, that doesn't go far enough in terms of the information it's providing to us. It's vital that we access the, the detail here in order to explore all viable options and seek to secure an alternative outcome to Amazon's decision to close that site. And I, urge Amazon to, I urged Amazon during that meeting to engage with the local trade unions, um, and at my request, the company has agreed to engage with the Inverclyde Task Force to better understand the potential impact uh, on the local economy. Neil, Neil Bibby. I thank the Minister for that answer and also for his recent updates. To support the workforce, I hope the Minister will continue to urge Amazon to think again and also seriously explore with them options to relocate locally if the current site is deemed unsuitable, working alongside the GMB and the Council. I know the Minister, as a member of the Inverclyde Socio-Economic Task Force, understands the long-standing challenges this community faces. Yet already this year, 300 jobs look set to go at Amazon. Ports on the Clyde have lost out on free port status to the east and north, undermining their competitiveness. And Inverclyde Council faces a £6 million black hole in its budget, raising the prospect of more job losses. Given all of this, does the Minister share my concern that the Inverclyde economy has been undermined? And what action will the Government therefore take to support the local economy and ensure the area gets a fair deal? Minister. Uh, we're focused on all parts of Scotland and making sure they maximise their full potential. And as uh, the member knows, I engage closely um, with, uh, with members and others um, in, uh, in Inverclyde. And looking forward to the next task force meeting on, uh, on Monday of next week, which I'll be attending in person to take forward discussions on how we can work together to, uh, to um, ensure that the economy in Inverclyde is maximised to its, to its full potential. Um, and of course, there's a range of support, including, of course, uh, city region deal projects and others that the Scottish Government supports and funds to uh, support the development of the economy locally. Question number seven, Jamie Halker johnson To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the comments by the Scottish Chambers of Commerce regarding the budget 2023-24 that it represents a clear disadvantage for Scotland's businesses and workers. Cabinet Secretary. President, officer, I do not agree with that assessment. 
In arriving at our income tax policy for 2023-24, we have sought to carefully balance the need to raise revenue with the impact on households, businesses and the wider economy at the current time. The majority of people in Scotland will still pay less income tax than if they lived elsewhere in the UK, and our income tax policy will enable us to make additional investment in the National Health Service by exceeding the health resource barnet consequentials from the UK Government. In addition, Scotland offers the most comp comprehensive social contract in any part of the United Kingdom, making Scotland an attractive place to live, work, study and do business. Jamie Hawker Johnson. Um, as I highlighted with the Cabinet Secretary at Committee this morning, the tourism and hospitality sectors are facing severe pressure at the moment, but the budget provides little comfort. Now, as Ali, Annie Wells um, suggested, the sector south of the border will receive a 75% discount on rates next year, while well, Scotland's Government, despite receiving hundreds of millions of pounds of Barnet consequentials to deliver the same, has chosen not to. The Scottish Beer and Pub Association says this puts Scottish pubs at a significant disadvantage. The Scottish Hospitality Group said the budget offered nowhere near enough to see the sector through and that many small businesses won't survive. And the Scottish Tourism Alliance expressed the disappointment of their members and warned that 23% of Scotland's tourism businesses were in survival mode. So if the Cabinet Secretary won't offer the same to Scotland's struggling sector, will he at least lobby his ministerial colleagues to roll back some of the extra and necessarily regulatory burdens, such as the delayed short-term lets licensing and deposit return schemes they intend to push on this already struggling sector. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, in a sense, Mr Halker Johnson answers his own question. The Government has already um, uh, delayed the introduction of the short-term licensing scheme to provide more time for the uh, sector to uh, adjust for that. Um, I, I think also um, the, the, the Minister for Public Finance set out in response to Annie Wells earlier on in the session the fact that about half of the retail tourism and hospitality businesses will benefit from 100% rates relief because we have a different small business bonus scheme in Scotland to the rest of the United Kingdom. So I think rather than just saying to us that we should replicate what goes on in England, if we replicated what went on in England on the small business bonus scheme, lots and lots of companies would have to start paying business rates. Yeah. And Mr Halker Johnson is not offering that. And finally, I come to the, 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 the point here. Mr Halker Johnson is asking me, according to the figures that uh, Mr Arthur put on the record, to commit to spending another £78 million on, the, on, on business rates relief. Now, if Mr Halker Johnson wants me to spend £78 million of business rates relief, he's got to have the honesty to come to Parliament and explain where the money is coming from. Now, already his colleagues are opposing the tax changes that I have made, so that's another £125 million or so that they've got to find. So really, the Conservatives cannot come here and ask me to spend more money when they won't tell me where the money is coming from. I'm determined to get our final question in. Question 8, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take to support businesses in key sectors of Glasgow's economy. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, the Scottish budget for uh, next year delivered the lowest non-domestic rates poundage in the UK for the fifth year in a row and maintains a package of reliefs worth an estimated £744 million. This, of course, will benefit many businesses in Glasgow. In addition, Scotland's industry leadership groups have played an important part in developing sectoral recovery plans. The ILG Chairs Roundtable facilitates cross-industry conversations and actions focused on areas of greatest strategic importance for industry. And many of those sectors are represented across Glasgow's wide and diverse economy. A Scottish Enterprise has invested £25 million in the Glasgow City Innovation District and is a founding member of the Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company. I'm looking glancy. I, I thank the Minister for that response. And one sector that's not been mentioned are back black cab drivers in Glasgow. Black cab drivers in Glasgow have been given until June this year to meet low emission zone targets. Most cannot afford the £61,000 for new cars that would comply. And on Friday, the Energy Savings Trust said that there was no money left for grants to retrofit vehicles and they stopped accepting applications from yesterday. So given the deadline to meet low emission zone standards is June, how on earth are cab drivers expected to meet the requirements? And will the Scottish Government commit to providing more financial support and grants to prevent major job losses in the black cab trade in Glasgow. As briefly as possible, Minister. 
Uh, the Scottish Government has made £7.2 million available to uh, support uh, LEZ funding for small businesses, including taxi operators and the households since 2019. Um, there is uh, um, support uh, as, uh, available for um, uh, retrofit of existing vehicles, and the Scottish Government has offered grant funding of up to 80%. Of the capital costs of that, and that's the most generous offer of its kind in the UK. And this year has seen record numbers of taxis being retrofitted as a consequence of that. And the grant funding uh, is available um, and providing over £2,000 per vehicle disposed of where uh, existing vehicles have been disposed. And that's uh, open to any micro businesses and taxis complies the most applications for that uh, in the last financial year. Um, and Glasgow City Council has a description mechanism for eligible taxi operators to receive a temporary exemption to the LEZ before, uh, beyond the enforcement date of June of uh, this year, and that will give taxi operators additional time to comply. Um, but I'm very happy to take any other points the member wants to raise uh, separately in discussion and to raise those with Glasgow City Council. With apologies to those that I wasn't able to call for supplementaries, I would make the plea that uh, responses, particularly from, from ministers, um, in terms of the scripted responses, need to be shorter, allow more of these supplementaries in. We now need to move to the next uh, item of business. There will be a brief pause to allow front benches to change.